问一些问题，然后我相信说你们你们是全英语教学。嗯，我我们自称全英语教学，可是学生自己会投诉中文。啊，了解。他们全英文哦，真的、啊、这么厉害？那我们今天对话是不是也要全英文一下？<笑>可能会比较好，因为其实中文是我的第二语言。And I think in English anyway. Oh, okay, okay. <笑> okay. <笑> okay, so so let let this get started.、Yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason I'm here today is to ask about your interest and also your availability. For some kind of interaction with students,、mm, sure.、Um, not just students, but also their parents, because、mm -hmm. students don't listen to anybody. Their、mm -hmm. parents, they listen. Well, that's a good idea. You should do that. Okay.、Um, so、uh, I, I gathered a list of questions that the students would like to ask you. Sure, sure, of course. Because you're an、them. expert in some areas. Okay. And then I also have some of my own questions too. Okay. Okay.、Um, but today is not really an interview. I just want to let you know about our students and let you know about what they're interested in.、Mm -hmm. So the actual interaction, whether it's an interview or it's a speech or anything, that's the part where people really need to hear what you really want to say. Okay. Okay. I, I just for the record, I have a very similar arrangement with the Minerva School. Oh, okay, uh, they're they're、uh, setting the campus right in, yeah, in yeah, Taipei、yeah. for for their semester, and、yeah. I will also enroll in very similar activity. Oh, that's great! That's great.、Mm -hmm. uh, the the Minerva's、uh, Asia director Ken Ross. Yeah. We were neighbors in Shanghai. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah、wow. I, I,、uh -huh. I was working in a school in Shanghai, and、uh -huh. I was holding lots of charity work,、um, charity、sure. things.、Uh -huh. So、uh, I found out about him, Minerva University. Ah, interesting.、Uh, Ken Ross. Okay, he's in Shanghai. Hey, Ken, do you want to talk about your experiences with charity and things like that? And I said, okay. So he came, and it was really weird because he said he didn't know what, and then second time he said English, and it was really long. And I'm like, why are you doing this? And then after a few weeks, I was going home. I took the elevator, and I saw him. Why are you here? <laughs> so we live in the、are、same. Are you following、building. me? Yeah. So we live in the <laughs> same. Turns out you're neighbors.、Yeah. Okay. And then、uh, he actually came back to Taiwan before、uh -huh. me, so、Excellent. I see him all the time now. Okay. Okay. So、um, there's. Let me tell you about my school first. Sure, of course. So、uh, we're called BIS. We're a very、mm -hmm. small school. It's、um, it's an experimental education institution. So I'm sure you know about this. We don't really follow the normal public、uh, curriculum. Yeah.、Um, but we are. We do. We are overseen by the Board of Education. There's standards we need to meet.、Um, so our school is a first-year school. This is actually our first semester, and、um, we have 30 students, mostly boys.、Mm -hmm. It's like a three-to-one boys-to-girls.、Okay. Uh, and、uh, most of our kids, they will go abroad for university.、Um, most of these kids will go to Canada, and some of them are thinking about other countries, like maybe. Japan or、mm -hmm. England and Australia. Okay.、Um, and basically, these kids come from pretty wealthy or well-off families,、um, so they've seen quite a bit more of the world than、mm -hmm. maybe normal public school students.、Mm -hmm. They're all very nice kids,、mm. but they don't. Not all of them work very hard.、Mm. Um, they're very curious. Mm. To hear about things,、mm. uh, so they have lots of questions. Okay.、Um, so I gathered some of the more studious students together. Studious. Yes.、Huh? And, and I said, "Hey, I'm, I'm going to go talk to、uh, Tom Chong、okay. later. That's right.、Mm -hmm. uh, you know, are there any questions that you want to ask?" Okay.、Um, and basically, there's three main categories. There's、okay. education and personal experience. Sure. Then there's technology and the environment, and then there's the workplace、uh, of the future. It sounds great.、Right. Um, maybe I'll let you know basically what they're. Or maybe I can take a look at it. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Because you you have a extra copy for me. I'm sure. I have. My, my, my printer is broken. I made so many copies. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So actually,、um, the education one is、um, mostly around homeschooling, and、mm -hmm. of course my transition、uh, mm -hmm. to puberty and so on.、Mm -hmm. uh, but but mostly about alternative education itself. Okay, so that's nice. I'm I'm happy to、um, talk that.、Mm -hmm. um, and、uh, so、climate change, explain blockchain like I'm five,、uh, and、um, workspace and the future.、Um, yeah, these are all all very studious. 
Um, it sounds just studious. They're just <laughs> asking. I don't know if they're really going to listen very closely. Okay, okay. Um, and of course, I, I work in a school, so I have some personal questions about what uh -huh. you think about education. Okay, so, so why don't we just go through your questions? Because as you mentioned, the students' questions, um, maybe I'll speak in a lot of detail by the mm -hmm. chance that they actually listen to the entirety of the, this video. The good students will. The good, oh, the good students, students will. will. Uh, not, not, okay. not of this video, of <laughs> maybe the next time we meet. Yeah, maybe we, we do a face-to-face. -face. Yes. I got an emergency from Stalin, so... What emergency? Uh, Cooking emergency. Yeah, Cooking emergency. <laughs> Cooking emergency. <laughs> Fire emergency. 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 Uh, maybe do some like raw brushes uh, answer and then we can arrange a time for more in-depth in conversation with the students. Okay, sure. If that's okay with you. Um, so, do, do you want to talk about the format first or the actual content first? Well, whatever, in whichever. Um, the, the format, uh, what, what have you um, tried and found work? So, like do we do three uh, study groups? Uh, there's no studying going on. Yeah. There's, uh, there's no studying going on. There's lots Three of learning groups. groups. <laughs> <laughs> Three curiosity groups. We, we did a program. Okay. Uh, one of these things that I'm hoping you'll be interested in. Okay. Uh, let me show you the picture of what we did last time. Okay. Um, this was actually with Fenros. So basically, I asked him to talk about the topic that he's most well versed in, which is higher education. Of course. So uh, if you know Ken, you know that he really likes to talk. Yeah, okay. So Let's see. He talked for about mm -hmm. 30, 40 minutes about his school and how education is changing. And then after that, we had a sit down, like a Q&A, where I presented him with some questions I wanted to ask him, mm -hmm. and I presented him with some questions mm -hmm. that I wanted him right, to so it's like a fireside chat. Yeah. Okay. To, to answer so that other for, people... For two hours. Okay. Well, and then Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is something that sure. uh, you're interested in or you even have time for. But does it have to be 7 p.m.? Can, can, can it be like early in the day? Like afternoon or noon or even... It, it can be. The reason that we mm -hmm. scheduled it for later in the day yeah. this time is because we wanted the parents to hear it. That's right, that's right. Uh -huh. You know, parents are working. But of course, um, if you don't... If you don't... No, no, if, you, if you strongly prefer uh, a kind of after hour, uh, after work hour, <coughs> um, then, then I, can, I can do that. Uh, but usually it's just scheduled around Wednesdays. Okay. Because Wednesday is my talking to the public. Okay, okay. Right, it's my office hour. So um, my, my only ask is that it's on the record somehow. Like mm, we make a course. recording and publish to YouTube. That's mm. the easiest. Otherwise, we can make a transcript as well. Okay. Um, and so if you schedule it uh, in a Wednesday and make it maybe 6.30 to 8.30 or something mm. like that, then, then I can, uh, of course, do it. Yeah. That, that would be, well, we would be very grateful as, as a school, and I'm sure. Sure. Um, so that's what we basically did, and mm -hmm. a lot of the questions that I asked Kat that time, were, some of them were questions that the general public wanted to hear about, okay. but a lot of them were questions that I wanted him to answer for the general public so okay. he could say, say yeah. things. Okay. Yeah, I see that. Um, but we, we'll do the conversation in English. Uh, do all the parents understand English? It'll probably be in Chinese. Uh, in Mandarin. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, if we want to, if you're interested in next right, week. Right, so, so, I mean, I, I can't cover all three areas yeah, uh, that's in, a lot. in two hours. Certainly. So, certainly. so we, we might want to focus. Um, and, uh, I mean, I helped uh, making the current basic education curriculum, mm -hmm. but I'm less involved in alternative education now. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want to hear about alternative education, actually my dad is a, mm -hmm. <laughs> or my mom, <laughs> is, a, is a better person to talk about it. Certainly, certainly. Um, and so maybe we, we don't do education after all. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually you, you did that already, right? So we can focus on uh, the workplace of the future. I think that's an excellent um, topic. Okay. Uh, and also, um, I can mention something about 
distributed ledgers, that is to say blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, into it, but in the context of um, bettering the workplace in the future. Mm -hmm. So not tech for tech's sake, mm -hmm. but tech as a part of the social technology, the social fabric. Mm -hmm. And I'll be much more comfortable uh, doing that. And climate change, I mean, there's mitigation and there's adaptation, mm -hmm. and uh, each aspect will easily take two hours mm -hmm. to Certainly. talk. And, and then that will become a climate change seminar. Yeah. Um, maybe let's not do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, because really it's very systemic and, and have a lot of repercussions in both mitigation and adaptation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I might not be the best person to talk about. Maybe you can invite, I don't know, Dr. Tong Ximing or, or someone who is actually a climate scientist okay. uh, to talk about these. So maybe we say workplace of the future mm -hmm. uh, or workplace from the future, at the future, well, well, whichever. Uh, and then uh, we focus on just the future of work, uh, and then we bring some tech environment education into it, if that's okay with you. Of course, of course. Okay. Yeah, I think um, the main audience would, again, mm. probably be working professionals, 35 mm -hmm. to 50 Like not years old. yet retired, so still yeah. relevant to them. So they're, what they're worried about is the workplace of the future, not for themselves, but for their children. Of course, so, of course. So of course they want to hear about that. Okay, okay. So, so uh, which... Um, week would you like it to be? Um, I'm not totally sure about how your schedule is looking because... No, I'm re available if I'm not flying out, of course, uh, every Wednesday. Okay. Our school year is similar to that of the American school year, okay. except we also have Chinese New Year off. Meaning? <laughs> so that means we, we finish school on the 13th of December, okay. and then we start school again in the first two or three days of January. But we're only in school for about two weeks, and then we go on vacation again. What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, interesting schedule. Well, we can't have... Like, super interesting. We, we can't not have Chinese New Year no, in Taiwan. No, that's but, uh, may maybe not the best idea. Yeah. So, um, so the day before the Chinese New Year, uh, the, that Wednesday would be January the 22nd. January the 22nd. Is that something we can work with? January 22nd on a Wednesday. That's definitely something that we can work with. Okay. January 22nd. Um, wait, don't quote yeah. me on that yet. No, okay. It's most likely. It's most likely. Yes. Mostly harmless. Um, <laughs> again, any time that you are available and we are actually in session is totally okay with so, us. So when do you resume session after the, um, the new year? I think Chinese New Year for us is about eight, maybe nine days. Uh, okay, so he'll be back in like February 5th, we'll be okay. Okay. Right? Yeah, it's very possible. Okay. Yeah, um, so, so, so the reason I came today is because yes. I, I know you must be terribly busy. No, not on Wednesdays. <laughs> not on Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I, I'm not really sure um, what sort of format you would be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Because if we as a private institution mm -hmm. held this talk yeah. and then publicized it, it would be something very similar to marketing for ourselves. Sure, I'm so, fine with that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. No, I, I just did the only thing I ask is that uh, everybody can learn from our conversation by watching either a live stream mm -hmm. or a recorded version or at the very least a transcript. And, and that for me is for public good okay. because we're contributing to the commons. Um, and, and that's the only ask really. Okay, well, we'll, we'll definitely do that because mm -hmm. that's in our own best interest yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, right, so would you prefer before or after the Lunar New Year so we can get essential down? Probably. Probably after the okay. Lunar New Year okay. would be easier to plan for. Okay. I'm sure. So, would you prefer the 12th or the 5th? Um, when would you need to know why? Um, I, I know you'd rather know right now, but I'm not okay. sure if I can give you an answer. That's right. Oh, you, you can't? Okay. Um, well, I mean, um, I'm also planning uh, my overseas trips, mm -hmm. uh, and so um, I can't promise beyond these two dates. Okay. Uh, but I know for sure that um, I'll uh, be back in Taiwan from India, actually, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the 5th. And so my preference would be on the 5th. 
Uh, but I can do 12 if you let me know, going, uh, like blowing up in advance. Okay, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just tentatively reserve the fifth. Okay, thank you for that. And from 6.30 to 8.30. Mm -hmm. And if you want to change it, just just let me know and uh, see if I can change. It. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you for that. No problem. Um, I'm not sure how much free time you have. Can I like can I really ask half you an hour? Half an hour. So actually, a lot of time for for your questions. <laughs> I, <laughs> not not for climate change. I, I would like yeah. to ask you about <laughs> sure. your your feelings about youth and growing up in school and learning uh -huh. and things like that. So maybe the second question. Sure. Have you, have you felt that today's youth are less motivated than they should be? Yeah, work hard is for robots. <laughs> um, I don't work hard. I think, I think most people naturally are lazy and try to not work hard, but yeah. at, at most times in our lives we, we have the ability to remind ourselves, but I should be working, so I'll do a little bit. I've never done that. <laughs> but the kids today, uh -huh. Do, do you feel that they're even less motivated than perhaps you were when you were younger? So I'm motivated only by intrinsic motivations. Mm -hmm. I'm not motivated by extrinsic mm -hmm. motivations, meaning like relative uh, position in class mm -hmm. or, or whatever, a linear projection that is the uh, scoring or whatever. I'm never motivated by that. Mm -hmm. And so if you mean those motivations, they work even less so, mm -hmm. uh, the external ones uh, to, in today's kids, I would say it's, it's likely the case, uh, both for public schools and uh, alternative schools as mm -hmm. well. So uh, when we're doing the new curriculum, what we're uh, building around is called competencies. And mm -hmm. the competencies are the ones that are intrinsically uh, motivational. Mm -hmm. uh, the motivation of curiosity, that's autonomy. Mm -hmm. The uh, motivation of um, getting to know people, that's yeah. interaction. Uh, and the motivation to leave the planet a better place uh, than you came in. Uh, and that's for the common good. And these three intrinsic motivations, I think, are stronger in today's young people. Whenever they are looking for a job or whatever, they uh, look for jobs that create meaning uh, instead of just salary or any other linear status mm -hmm. or, or a career ladder, quote unquote. And, and so I, I do think today's kids, they have a stronger internal motivation compared to my contemporaries when I was a kid. Hmm, maybe because society and school treated them differently. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, but as I said, the, the students in schools that I, I have worked in for most of my career yeah. usually grew up in pretty comfortable surroundings. Yeah. So what I often have observed is they, they seem to have no intrinsic motivation and they're also not helped along by extrinsic motivation. Basically they're, they're, they're just a zero and they, they like to spend all day on the internet. Um, but not really doing anything productive on the internet. Just they exist, but they create very little value. Mm. Ha have you? No, I haven't. I haven't observed that. I mean, I, I've seen many people just working um, collaboratively um, to make remixes. That's very popular. For mm. example. Harry Potter fan fictions. <laughs> uh, these are very popular, uh, and maybe they spend the entire month just drawing mm. a uh, fan fiction character, uh, or to to just make some manga uh, mm. around Harry Potter, uh, and and that's that's fine. Uh, and and to me, it's still productive. It's just not in a linearly measurable way. Mm. Uh, in in that you can't really uh, put a dollar value to that. But, but they're still producing something. That's mm. what productive means. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I would like to hear your feelings about number five here. I'm sorry, there's no mm -hmm. numbers. Uh, the amount of information. Uh, we're getting so much information these days. Do, do you think that we'll ever hit a point where we as human beings will no longer be able to process the information? We've long since passed that point. Yes, but we don't feel it yet. Normal people still still feel like, oh, I'm in control, I decide what I see and don't see. Maybe one day we'll just be on the bed and we can't move. Huh. You mean like the matrix, right? So, something like that. <laughs> okay. Well, the matrix, 
It's an interesting picture, right? Uh, you just have a 10 gigabyte per second line, and the, the human mind can feel that it's anywhere in the world experiencing anything whatsoever, because that's what our sensory organs, mm -hmm. uh, the bandwidth of our sensory organs all combined is just around 10 gigabytes per second. Uh, and so if you can uh, replicate those signals, you, you really can transport like someone to Mars mm -hmm. uh, or whatever, or, or create the ambience feeling uh, that they are on Mars. And maybe that's what the movie Av Avatar uh, portrays. Mm -hmm. And so with um, 5G technology, uh, we're rapidly approaching that point. Yeah. Well, my main thing is, when the day comes, like you said, it's already been passed. Yeah. But when the day comes when we are aware that there's just so much information that I can't make sense of it anymore, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen to people? So people will make their own sense, right? Uh, what we're already seeing in earlier prototypes, uh, like Second Life, mm -hmm. um, is that people will just to make their own culture. Mm -hmm. Instead of being defined by the geographic boundaries mm -hmm. of your physical neighbors, they will be defined by the fan fiction community mm -hmm. uh, they, they belong to, and they will create new meanings uh, based on those shared cultural values. Uh, and we used to call them subculture, mm -hmm. but now there's literally everybody is in some mm -hmm. subcultures, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if that word even makes sense anymore. Uh, and so I think we will see a plurality of cultures, and the meaning making will take place within those cultures, and those cultures will seem very unproductive to other cultures. <laughs> Do, do you think this is going to cause a breakdown in society or government as we know it? So if the culture um, takes place um, in a not isolated way, like virtual reality mm -hmm. has the potential of people being trapped in a solo experience, mm -hmm. um, then yes, that's a real danger. That's, that's the virtual isolation. But on the other hand, it could also be a shared reality mm -hmm. uh, where people just together look at uh, public good because there's very few people in the uh, newer generation that feel so strongly about ownership anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they care about the experience, they take about, care about the, the design of the experience and the balance of the experience uh, in terms of like social justice or climate change or the future uh, generation, sustainability and so on. But they don't care that much as compared to our generation about uh, the ownership idea where you are um, cling to something physical excludes other people from mm -hmm. using it. Uh, they're much more into sharing, is what I'm saying. And so that holds some promise, so that people can actually talk about common issues, about social issues. In our participation platform, join GOVTW, the most active participants are people who are around 65 years old, and people who are around 15 years old. I think both because they care more about the next generation, but also they are less constrained by this ownership base of thinking. Mm -hmm. I think you must be surrounded by very positive people every day. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what I'm worried about right now is when, when people reach the point, when humanity reaches the point where a large portion of the population feels like they're no longer in control of anything anymore, mm -hmm. they, they may just switch that mm -hmm. into themselves. Withdraw, withdraw into right. themselves. And yeah. then maybe that portion of the world or population is really isn't doing anything that's productive for the common good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about if we we'll reach that point mm -hmm. and, and what the world might look like if we reach that point. Yeah, I think the, the common good uh, is defined, it could be very narrowly defined, like anything we can put a dollar value or a KPI or whatever on, uh, then of course uh, it's true what you said, that maybe people will feel less attached mm -hmm. uh, to those uh, traditional like dollar value common goods. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, the sustainable um, targets also include a uh, very broad swath uh, of cultural values as well, um, like uh, partnership. Uh, for the common goals, mm -hmm. and that allows for a lot of creativity uh, in, for example, just portraying uh, really how the climate change affects us. That calls for a huge amount of creativity, and that extends beyond jurisdictional boundaries because carbon emission doesn't care about geographical boundaries anyway. Um, and so it, it creates a lot of opportunity for cross-cultural dialogue, and that's the uh, ability to listen and ability to convey ideas across coaches. That is something that um, AI currently can't uh, mm. automate, mm. right? So they can get the dictionary translations right, but they can't get the cultural nuances uh, right yet. Uh, so uh, before we hit the point where 
the quantum computers um, in that science fiction territory. Um, within the next 10 years or 20 years, I still think that this ability to listen and to convey across culture, cultural bridges, uh, that is still a major source of uh, the society's productivity. It's just we have to shift from a uh, industrial age point of view where service is subservient mm. to product making mm. uh, to a pure service oriented view where there really is no product, quote unquote, uh, but just the service of uh, carrying and creating meaning across cultures. And if viewed that way, I think a lot of people will feel that there's some of their lived experiences that they want to conserve. Uh, as well as conveyed to a wider uh, population of people. Just look at how many people became YouTubers even when they're uh, very old now. Uh, they still enjoy uh, starting their own live streaming stations. Uh, and we have a lot of that in Taiwan, maybe because you only have to pay 15 euros per month for unlimited bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, I think, cultural making. And we see a lot of people who were previously with strong participate in this kind of culture because mm -hmm. they feel that it creates shared meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Yes. Um, are there any new or fun, interesting ideas mm -hmm. that we can use software or technology to do yeah. inside the school? Is there anything that you'd really like to see happen? Sure. Um, actually, there's um, a uh, experiment that I did before I become digital minister, mm -hmm. uh, which is using augmented reality mm -hmm. uh, for teaching. Specifically, I asked a few schools to do a 3D scan, a 3D modeling of their classroom, and then I put on live. Um, at that time, it's still like wired and, and kind of not very mobile, but now you, you can take it anywhere. Um, and then uh, when I put on the VR headset, I just feel that I am physically present in, mm. say, Madrid mm. or in some other city. And I actually interact with the students' avatars, and they can actually experience the other people in other classrooms by overlaying the classrooms together. Oh, and okay. it, it's now actually very easy to do. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of uh, free software to, to do that. And so when you do th things this way, I think uh, what, what Minerva is trying to do, which is city as campus, mm -hmm. is based on the idea that you first have to have some shared lived-in experiences uh, for people to feel that mm -hmm. their capstone projects are really having an impact right. uh, to the society. But if you uh, do things through uh, augmented reality, the cost can be massively lowered mm -hmm. so that you can go to the non-municipal places because a lot of existing curriculum in this one is still based on fiber optic connection. Mm. And that really limits the virtual classrooms uh, you can connect to. So likely it's already city centers and all the metropolis feel very roughly the same anyway. Um, but uh, with 5G technology, you can connect to the most rural places. You can connect to the Yushan mountain and, and so on. You just send a robotic avatar or even a floating drone mm -hmm. and, and everybody feel that they are on top of Yushan. Uh, and then people can really have a much uh, more in-depth discussion about, say, um, geography, about, say, climate change, about, say, environmental protection, and things like that. So a virtual classroom that's based on somewhere in reality, not a entirely like abstract, uh, hallucinated uh, classroom, but just transporting people uh, to an excursion to a place that uh, is very difficult to reach via physical means. And it's like the hologram room in Star Trek. That's right, it, 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 yeah. the whole deck. Yeah. Yes, the whole deck. That's right. So, the whole deck, I think, is great for education. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this because I was thinking, well, what are young people interested in? I only see a small portion of them, but they are interested in games. Yes. But what kind of games are they interested in? They're, a lot of them are still interested in role playing games where yes. they feel like they are somebody and they can be somebody. Exactly. Um, so, I was thinking. Some students are not too happy or too motivated about learning content matter or participating in school because there's always a more interesting alternative available to them. There's yeah. the virtual world, there's the RPG world. There's the table talking. Yes, that too. Uh -huh. So I was wondering if there was a way to gamify use, everything. Yes, to, game, to gamify school basically uh -huh. where it's not just grades that are given, uh -huh. let's say gold coins or yeah. scores or something, but actually building a well-rounded individual. Yeah. Uh, caring about other people will result in a level up. Maybe right. even helping your friends will result in a level up. Yeah. Doing things in arts and culture will result in a level up. Uh -huh. And then with this sort of program, because today's kids are very visual. Mm -hmm. they, they're used to seeing things in the this kind of grading system or like bar graphs or something. So a lot of the time you, you ask them, hey, um, how, are your, how are your studies going? 
and they don't know how to answer you because they right. really don't know. That's but right. if you could, if you could if visualize a skill, it, skill for them, tree or something that's right. like if that, you could yeah. visualize it for them, they might actually feel more ownership mm -hmm. of their own production and learning. Yeah. Um, has anybody ever? I'm sure people have looked into it. Has any company or any organization actually built? Well, for program? for online learning of uh, a program, it's mm -hmm. already the norm. So if you talk to code.org, uh, I did uh, or Khan Academy mm -hmm. uh, or the usual suspects, yeah. they're already using this kind of unlock specific skills, a tree of skills, uh, RPG way uh, to shape. And there's even like the code combat mm -hmm. that literally asks you to enter into an RPG and write some code. Mm -hmm. yeah. but I'm wondering, uh, do these actually look like games? Yeah, they do. They do. Because uh, the other, the flip side of this is I, I would, I would like their production, their skill trees, or their experience points, mm -hmm. or whatever, okay. to actually have meaning in the real world so they can bring it back again. Because I tried hard, because I studied mm -hmm. hard, because I helped other people, so I gained social capital. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I, I gained gold coins. And with mm -hmm. this capital, I can in turn do good things in the real world for mm -hmm. my friends, or mm -hmm. treat them to some chocolate, mm -hmm. or actually uh, donate to charity or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's very good uh, that we connect uh, the friends that we met, mm -hmm. which we already have social capital with in the online gaming world, mm -hmm. uh, to face-to-face -face gatherings. Uh, and um, I basically learned the, uh, my English vocabulary with a card game mm -hmm. called Magic the Gathering. And, and now, nowadays, mm -hmm. nowadays uh, it's played online as well. Yeah, right. But uh, people still meet face to face to enjoy this physical card playing experience. Mm -hmm. And as a MTG player, I can literally travel to many places in the world and find like-minded mm -hmm. people uh, to enjoy a set of games, even though we have never met before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, more cultural than, say, chess, mm -hmm. because uh, while you can certainly translate the chess pieces to different cultural meanings, there's only so many chess pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. But the artwork of the magic, the, the translation of the, the magic rule text, and all the um, interesting fantasy settings, uh, these can carry different cultural norms. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's different magic sets built in, say, the Greek, or the Arabic, or the uh, Japanese, or whatever different cultures. So people also feel like they travel over the world just simply by playing this card game. And so um, I think um, many of the communities, they may start online now, but uh, they, if they result in face-to-face -face meetings, if they result in physical meetups, if they result in more travel to meet people to do something together, then that is the translation into uh, reality that you were uh, referring to. But there, if there is no offline counterpart, then of course it may reinforce isolation sentiments. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking that is because I've been shopping this idea around for a long time, yeah. and I know it's technologically possible. Sure. Um, but then I'm getting a lot of pushback too, saying, "Yeah, you can do this, but it's all extrinsic motivation. They're gonna this and that, and it's, it doesn't follow psych psychology, like psychology studies and things like that." And I, I don't mean, know how you, you mean can, Minecraft. No, I mean <laughs> gamifying. And have you watched Moneyball before? Yeah. So basically, uh, giving everything a value. Yeah, but, but what, what I'm saying is that it's mechanism design, right? So mm -hmm. if you design the mechanism so that you um, nudge, I think that's the word, mm -hmm. uh, toward a, a linear value system, mm -hmm. then people will feel it's extrinsic. Yes, that's right. But if it's a, I think the jargon is a open world yes. game, uh, like Minecraft, mm -hmm. actually a good uh, um, example. Um, or if it uh, allows for many innovative solutions mm -hmm. while being uh, corresponding to some part of reality, mm -hmm. like the world of Goo, uh, it's very good for teaching physics. Mm -hmm. um, but you can be very creative about how you apply physics. So in these sandbox games, what we call it, uh, there really is no um, extrinsic linear system. Mm -hmm. There's many uh, systems in it but people have to forge their own values out of those right, positions. Right. So if you, you uh, use exclusively uh, open world sandbox games, I, I don't think these critiques uh, will have anything against them. Yeah, I, I basically think school shouldn't really be about teaching content because mm -hmm. you can go online and find it in five seconds. I, I think school should be a sort of structure where we can encourage and nudge young people to grow in ways that are commonly accepted as 
attractive and good and good mm -hmm. for the common good. Yeah, right? to, become to meet people. many communities. Yeah. Right. Okay. And if, if we did that, if, so basically there, there's endless ways that you can create value. Mm -hmm. And if you can create value, then of course you get, it's like the game, you get points, you get points, you get yeah. whatever. But there are lots of people that are so totally against the idea of giving scores or coins or rewards that they just shut off to this idea. Yeah, but, but I think they worry because it seemed like one value would dominate right. over the others. Mm. That you would sacrifice the other values, even creating negative externalities mm. just to get that single value, right, that single right. coin. Uh, and for example, this is a very gamified system, right? This is the sustainable development goals. We okay. uh, have that at school too. <laughs> that, that's right. I mean, it's literally 169 uh, quantified targets mm -hmm. and in 17 categories. And so each one, you can argue, is gamified. Mm. But it's gamified in a broad enough way that people can feel that whichever of the 17 values that you care most about, mm -hmm. you also bring value to the other 16 mm, right. value systems. Yes. And, and that's important. So uh, I think it's not about not projecting things in a quantified way. Mm. Uh, it's rather about not to the exclusion of everything. So I think if you start designing so that you can climb the ladder of at least six, uh, 17 different uh, value systems, like the sustainable goals, mm -hmm. then I think it's a very balanced design. Nobody will be against that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll have to invite you to talk to some other people again then. Okay, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do the ambassadorship for the sustainable goals. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm more, more concerned about just general education. Yeah. Um, can we have time for one more yeah, sure, sure, question? Sure, sure, sure. Of course, of course. Um, maybe we can take a look at number three. Sure. Um, I know that you've helped shape some parts of the current education system. Yeah, the new curriculum. Yeah. But people's thoughts die hard. Oh. There, there's still a large populated, large po uh, swath of the population that still think rather traditionally. Yeah, sure. So because they were educated before the new curriculum. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you, are there any philosophical or directional disagreements you have with? current thought, not current design, but actually the current thought of society as a whole. Like but, but you just have to read the new curriculum <laughs> to, to see those change of directions. In particular, I think the uh, focus on linear projections based on the quote-unquote disciplines, mm. um, I think that is the main disagreement of the current um, thoughts and the new curriculum. Mm -hmm. The new curriculum talk about um, the idea of autonomy, mm. which is essentially saying uh, if the student finds something interesting, an interesting problem to solve, it may be environmental, societal, or economic, uh, instead of confining them to different disciplines, mm. which is like constellations, right? In a star, there's many constellations, but that is just one way to memorize the stars. Mm. And every culture has their own different way to sort the mm. stars. But uh, previously, we kind of confined people to their major or their main uh, uh, interest, and that's like a constellation. Uh, and then uh, we rank and judge people based on that. Mm. But a truly cross-disciplinary approach would be start from the basic question that you would like to inquire, and essentially make your own constellation, because there may be some nearby stars here and some nearby stars there. And there's still stars. I mean, these are the shared uh, knowledge and wisdom uh, in the uh, civilization, but they may be labeled differently. And so this cross-disciplinary or even anti-disciplinary way, I think is the main philosophy behind the new curriculum design. Uh, but by and large, I would say not only Taiwan, uh, the, the entire world uh, may not be that anti-disciplinary, mm -hmm. certainly not higher education. Uh, and this higher education are also being transformed to be more capstone based, to allow people to kind of drift between different departments, mm. to have a major, not in a department, but rather in a institution or rather even across institutions. And that is happening uh, as we speak, uh, but it happens slowly. Mm. But I think there's a strong motivation for people to think beyond existing disciplinary because these uh, merge so quickly now. Um, there's, because of uh, automation and everything, what used to be very stable disciplinary boundaries may change in 12 years. Mm -hmm. It may change before the 12 years. Uh, but if we look at a basic education and train people in a linear uh, way, 
and that's become entirely automated or merged into some other discipline, mm. they will feel actually a sufferer of dignity uh, when they find whatever they have identified with has disappeared. Mm. But if they start from their personal inquiry, then all of these merges and so on are just you know assistive tech intelligence that helps them along the, the mission. And that is why common good is uh, the core competence. Are you getting any pushback from established school or education administrators mm -hmm. or is anybody complaining like I just don't have the manpower or my manpower isn't properly trained to execute it? Yeah, I think I think training is very important and that, that is why we're not rolling out the new curriculum to all the grades simultaneously. Mm -hmm. We're only rolling out uh, for the first, for the seventh and for the tenth grade. Mm -hmm. and, and it will take six years uh, for everybody to kind of uh, witness this gradual transition. So uh, I think that's practical and we do get pushbacks, especially around maybe the fourth uh, to sixth uh, grade, mm -hmm. which is traditionally when you start being a more, uh, transitioning being a more playful culture into a more linear culture. Yeah, and the yeah. machines. <laughs> right, exactly, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so, so that is maybe the hardest, but you, they will only get, have to change uh, four years, five years down the road. I remember there, there's many people talking about this, of course, and mm -hmm. I think it was Ken Robinson or somebody who said yeah. basically everybody wants to change, but we can't change because universities stay the same. Uh, we, we are actually, we've already changed the University Act mm -hmm. so that uh, the different departments may join to form a curriculum mm -hmm. and that they may hand out uh, equivalent to graduate school degrees uh, by having the students complete a two-year capstone. And, and so all of this is, is already in the law. It's just whether uh, university would like to embrace uh, this new, new way of working for essentially lifelong education, because then it's not predicated on the, your uh, age, really. Whenever you have a capstone to work with, uh, no matter your age, you can enter this kind of programs uh, across universities. So there's two approaches. One is uh, alternative schooling in the university level mm. that ignores the entire structure and just do things, you know, just like what you're doing uh, to the basic education level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one possibility. The, the other is some experimental um, divisions uh, within existing universities that want to work with the new University Act. Uh, I think as administrators in schools, uh, some people are just obsessed with being able to fairly and properly assess and give a grade to each and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and what they're worried about is if there's too much variation or too much freedom given, mm -hmm. then it's impossible to grade people. Too many dimensions. Yes, yeah. and so, mm -hmm. so then the, the question becomes, can I, in good faith, say this person has graduated from, let's mm -hmm. say, high school or university? Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the big problems facing mm -hmm. administrators today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, in liberal arts uh, disciplines, that's already the case. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a graduate degree, uh, in, in modern art, in contemporary art, mm -hmm. that, that is already such a case going on, right? So we will just have to accept the fact that more and more things are creative and design work instead of uh, measurable, repetitive work because these are automated. Well, one of my, my thoughts on this is I think things can be graded, but they shouldn't be graded by one person and they shouldn't be graded on a very fixed and rigid mm -hmm. rubric. Yeah, yeah multi-dimensional. It should be... Yeah. It should be judged by a society or at least a, a group of people as a whole. I totally agree. It should be judged by the social impact. Yes. So does it create value? And the environmental impact. And the economic impact. That's right. And, and if it's acceptable by the majority of people, then okay, you pass. That's, That's right. right. That's right. That's right. I totally agree. Um, but this would also require basically a paradigm shift in the thought of society and what they define education as, mm -hmm. what they define training as. Mm -hmm. So society has to become involved in education once mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. in order for education to be able mm -hmm. to move towards. Yeah, we're, we're, we're already seeing some of that in our university social responsibility uh, programs in the USR. 
mm. uh, as, as well as in the university undergrad level entrepreneurship programs that's mm. the you start and, and these two programs are specifically designed so that students work is just not by the arbitrary linear success mm. metric but rather uh, by the environmental ecological that's one part and social and economic impact that they're having uh, to the surrounding community. And this is good because the surrounding community and feel that the university is not working in isolation, mm -hmm. that it is also a think tank for the community, mm -hmm. for regional revitalization and so on. And so I think that's the direction definitely Taiwan has been taking for the past three years or so. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, I've taken up quite a bit of your time. No, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, are, are there any questions or any wonders that you have about our school or? Yeah, sure. So, so I think for our fireside chat, uh, it's best if um, I, I usually use a system called Slido or S L I D O, uh, where I can set it up myself and send you the link. Okay. But I would encourage every parent and their uh, children uh, to ask me questions via the phone. Uh, this has two benefits. The first one is sometimes raising a hand to ask. Um, in front of your family members um, may require mm -hmm. um, a different social configuration uh, and that allows for pseudonymous uh, asking of questions. So this is in real time? This it is in real time. time. It's projected. So please prepare a projector and I'll bring my own device. Um, and the second good thing about that uh, is that because uh, the Slido is anonymous or pseudonymous, um, there may be some questions about your school. Mm -hmm. um, and that are, for example, when, when I was in, um, I think it was Zhongshan University, mm -hmm. the top voted, because they can vote on each other's question, the top voted one is why the university keep taking our motorcycles away. Uh, and then, <laughs> I mean, these kind of questions don't usually get asked, mm -hmm. but it at least gives you a picture of what people think of their everyday experience, even though I can't answer them, it's still a good thing mm -hmm. to surface uh, them uh, for as a social object to talk on. This and is an app that you can do it. Is, this is a website. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I can send you the link, but you can sure. also try it out for a bit. I think it's really good. For your longer classes, like longer than half an hour, um, it also essentially reutilizes the mobile phone of students as part of the class. Mm -hmm. So they can still like each other's questions. They can still mm -hmm. write things down, mm -hmm. but then that satisfy their, their screen addiction. Uh, and it they, does, they won't does. be distracted to other social media because mm -hmm. it's the, the class-specific social media. Um, and that also really helps the attention span of students. Uh, that's my first-hand experience. Mm, I, I think what I was, what I heard from Ken about the nervous system was that their system actually observes how often you ask questions and the quality of your questions. And even if you are looking at that's the right, that's right, that's right. The, the attention, <laughs> attention focus. Mm. But I think there there are more introvert people that would focus on something that's unmoving uh, rather than um, meeting somebody's gaze and I think it's just a different personality configuration mm -hmm. and so we, we should um, be as inclusive as possible and also uh, let them focus on their phones but still contribute to the discussion. Uh, I wonder if it'll in the end just develop towards the, the thing that we're all the most afraid of is that people will only look at their phones in the future. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But on the other hand, I think if we design the, the applications on their phones so that they serve as something that supports uh, the face-to-face the -face meetings, mm. then people will see on their phone what's coming next uh, and that gives them assurance and then they will have more time and attention uh, for conversations. Mm. So I think what's showing on their phone is really key if it's pro-social. Then, then that's good. Mm. And if it's antisocial in the sense that everybody is playing their own game, mm. uh, then of course that's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to take a look at this website then. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Cool. Um, is there a... I, I've told you about my target audience, yeah. mostly parents, some yeah. students. Is there a target audience that you would really like to... I'm sure you can already, but mm -hmm. for this particular uh, mm -hmm. person chat, Mm -hmm. Is there an audience that you really want to reach? No, I think it's up to you. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're the host. And how public would you like this to be? Would you like it to be open to the general public? Where would you like the venue be? Well, if it was just my school holding it, then it would probably be at school. But our okay. space is actually not very big. Last oh. time we had a talk. I'm guessing we had about 60 to 80 people in the audience. But that's, that's a good size. 
it, it allows for more uh, real time conversation. Mm. But it's quite packed. Okay. Um, of course, if if I brought this to my boss and I said, "Hey, uh, we are yeah, we are ready to do this and mm -hmm. open to the public," is okay. Then my boss will be like, "Okay, I'm going to rent the National Music Hall or something." Oh, I, I don't. Know. I actually talk in the Taichung Opera House system. So yes, okay. I'm, I'm familiar with the art setting um, and also the the Taipei as a contemporary art, the the TFAM or something like that. So but at the Fine Art Museum. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm okay with uh, you renting a museum, but it doesn't have to be that, because we can live stream it. That's so it. we can keep the face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to your uh, parents and students mostly, mm -hmm. but if they have like overseas friends uh, that they would like to dial in uh, and ask questions and things like that, uh, we can say, oh, we're live streaming this. So if you're not a VIS um, alum or parent or whatever, mm -hmm. um, then please dial in and, and you can still ask questions over the internet through this live system. Okay. So, um, of course, we would like to have a Q&A fireside uh, chat, but is there but you said that workplace in the future yeah. would be the topic that you yeah, like yeah, to yeah. start off as. That's right, that's right. Okay. Maybe you, you start asking me a few questions about that. And I explain about my workplace, mm -hmm. which is pretty futuristic anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we go from there. Okay. All right. And would it be possible to get some pictures that you like of yourself so we can start creating some... Yeah, posters. And, and yeah, I, I have many photos free of copyright restrictions. Okay. So an SD card can send you all these. Okay. It's That's on great. Pixabay and on Flickr. Yeah. All right. And of course, we will write up a short introduction. We'll let your office of and yourself take a look at it and say this is okay and then we'll send it out. Okay. All right. Um, anything you want from Japan? My wife is in Japan right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. In Chiba. Oh, okay. Um, no, it's fine. I visit Japan very often. <laughs> All right. My, my wife actually yeah. specifically asked me for a picture with you. Is that okay? okay. Of course. Yes. All right. So, so that's it. Uh, okay. Show for this. Selfie time. Yes.